Good day, fellow real estate investors. Today, we are taking a deep dive on the multifamily market for the bustling city of Oakland, California. San Francisco and Silicon Valley get a lot of fanfare, but today's data is going to be putting all eyes on the East Bay's biggest urban core, and that's Oakland. It's no joke that COVID rocked urban cities and data jumps all over the place, but today's supply and demand dynamics for Oakland are setting up the downtown core to be what I believe to be one of the nation's best plays in best performing rental growth markets in 2024 and 2025. For this report, we are really looking through the lens of investors that are considering brand new construction of class A multifamily apartment buildings in Oakland. I'm Colin Baring, CEO at Baring Capital, and we run several private equity real estate investment vehicles, and links to the information on those are in the descriptions below. So we love data. Numbers don't lie. And today we are diving into a whole lot of truth about Oakland. If you want to see more deep dives like this for other cities and other markets, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. So let's start with a macroeconomic view. Starting big picture and zooming out for a quick macroeconomic look at the Bay Area, according to the Mercury News, the Bay Area's EMA led the entire country in GDP growth throughout 2022 with 4.8% growth, which is a nominal $1.3 trillion. That's good enough for a number three ranking nationwide, only behind New York and the Los Angeles EMA, which is huge. Bay Area venture capital and its ecosystem still remains its economic juggernaut, and activity here in the Bay Area vastly outpaces the rest of the United States. When looking at venture capital as a whole, California raises more money than every other state combined. When looking only at the Bay Area and without LA, we pull in over 34.8% of all venture capital in the entire country. Nominally, it reaches $94 billion in 2021. But, whoa, 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 I heard everybody's leaving California for places like Austin or Miami. But, well, as of late, it is true that in the first half of 2022, Austin was on a record-breaking run, raising $3.4 billion. The Bay Area raised $52.4 billion in the same six months. That's 15 times more than Austin. In other words, Austin's all-time high nabbed a humble 6.5% of the amount commanded by Silicon Valley in the San Francisco Bay Area. What about Miami? Miami's hot. Did Miami outperform? Individually, Miami didn't even break the top 10. But if you reach even further and you grab all of Southeast Florida, it still ranks dead last out of the top 10 metros at a number 10 spot. And they raised $2.5 billion in VC money. The reality for these cities is that they're getting a lot of love and attention from the media because of how clickable their headlines are. Starting with a low basis can really help report massive growth. It's really just math. It's easy to double your performance if you're going from 1 billion to 2 billion. When you are already at 50 billion plus, it gets a little tougher, but Maybe that's not even the real question here. As a multifamily investor, why do you even like looking at VC money at all? To make it really simple, more VC funding turns into more hiring, which turns into more spending and higher rents. Historically, venture capital fundraising activity is a leading indicator for strong employment growth in high paying information and professional technical service sectors, which may include just about every high tech firm. The LAO researched this exact correlation. Their findings were pretty strong. In one particular data set, you can see that California's 2014 VC funding spike preceded a 2015 spike in job growth. No indicator is perfect, but the logic is pretty sound. The trends also continue all the way through COVID. The other item that follows VC funding rounds are IPOs. When a stock is very closely held by the owners and its employees, millions if not billions of dollars are earned through stock options, which is either spent or at least turns into ordinary income tax, and then it percolates making its way back into those same economies. If anything, venture capital activity is good for a local economy and the Bay Area in particular is crushing it. <laughs> More currently, early data from the end of 22 and going into 23 is showing a much more muted environment for venture capital, but the Fed essentially designed this response with current activity and raising rates. We're gonna get into that a little bit later in this report. As of the date of this publishing, equity markets are actually already debating whether the bottom is already in and a recovery in economic markets is going to start. So Silicon Valley and the Bay Area have a lot of stalwart tech companies, 
like the FANG stocks, Google, Facebook, Netflix, and everybody else. But what about the new guys? What about the new growth and hot job creation? Is that still in the Bay Area? Forbes recently released its annual list of VC-backed firms most likely to become unicorns and then maybe turn into IPOs. And a significant amount of those lists are all in the Bay Area. Of the 25 startups listed, 12 of them are based in the San Francisco Bay Area. On all levels, the Bay Area remains the undisputed king of venture capital funding. So, recently there's also been news of major layoffs at big tech. Does that mean that everything I just mentioned previously is going to come crashing down? All things being equal, it would be a cause for concern to hear about major layoffs. But, again, we'll just turn straight to the data. As reported by the Mercury News in December of 2022, the Bay Area powered big job gains, adding a net 13,600 jobs and a jaw-dropping 84% of California's statewide total. Even Governor Gavin Newsom jumped at the chance to parade around all of the overall strength of California's economy. And I quote, December closed out a full year of consecutive monthly job growth in 2022. That means that the entire year was all net job growth, no job losses. And that's incredible considering the headlines. Even with all these awful headlines about the layoffs, California's statewide unemployment rate remains unchanged at 4.1%, historically still low. We will be watching for more headlines and adding them to the future reports. But as of now, the Bay Area economy, from a macroeconomic standpoint, remains not only resilient, but truly robust. So that was a simple macroeconomic look. Let's zoom in on Oakland and its competitive market area, which covers the urban East Bay. The population is recently growing at just over 1% per year. But the changing nature of rentership is changing far faster than that. For someone looking to invest in a specific asset class, such as Class A multifamily, you want to look at the specific story of the underlying income in the demographics, growth in high household earnings, and stats like that. For Oakland, even generally looking at income, you're seeing the entire market become wealthier. In 2011, the median income was just over $51,000. And over the next 10 years, median income would grow a whopping 52.3%. But that's not all. The highest earners experience the highest growth. The proportion of household income earning more than 150 k per year increased 110.8% from being 12% of the population to over 26% of Oakland's population. Demo demand projects that by 2026, households earning over 150K per year will reach 31% of the total population, which is proportionally 147.6% more than in 2011. But wait, does that include homeowners, not just renters? Just dive deeper. Let's hone in on those who rent and the proportion of renters earning $150,000 a year, that number increased from 5,000 households in 2015 to 13,781 households in 2020, a five-year change of 175%. Even the 100 150 k bracket is impressive, going from 8,000 households to just over 13,000. That's a five-year change of 5,000 households, or 65% more. Growth, growth, growth. Another good story is affordability and the financial health of renters. Specifically, you wanna be looking at what percentage of their income is spent on rent. Generally, it's suggested not to spend any more than 30% of your income on rent or become what is called rent burdened. That means you have no money left over for anything else. So what does it look like in downtown Oakland? When looking at households that are earning over $75,000 plus, which includes over 51% of Oakland's renters in total, Renters are financially stronger now more than ever. From 2015 to 2020, the number of households that spend less than 20% of their income on rent increased by 7,356 households, or 55%. Households that spend less than 20 to 29% increased 5,382, or 83% compared to before. I can speak specifically to Oakland's high-end market in the downtown core, so check this. Earlier in 2022, when we were performing due diligence on the acquisition of a middle-tier Class A tower, the renter demographics were legendary to a multifamily investor. The average household income was $290,000 per year. The average age was only 29 years old, 
And the rent to income ratio for that entire group was only 13% across the board. Hit the like button on this video if your perception of downtown Oakland just changed. This quantitative data and growth is a positive trend for Oakland, but the story of the East Bay has always been about the difference of where people work versus where they live. This is a map showing where people work. Dark areas are high density office locations and light areas are low density. You can see downtown San Francisco and downtown Oakland are pretty clear right in the middle of those dark spots. So this is where people work. This is where they live. Wait a minute, so let's see that again. This is where they work, and this is where they live. This means that San Francisco's salaries live in Oakland. It's not just San Francisco either. It's Silicon Valley too. According to the US Census Bureau, over 44% of the entire Bay Area's workforce actually lives in the East Bay, including Oakland. Narrow down the data to just compare San Francisco versus the East Bay, and over 75% of those total residents all live in the East Bay. San Francisco, its economy, and its jobs certainly get a lot of praise. But as an apartment investor, I care more about where that money lives more than where it works. Supply and demand. It's time for the main event. In the end, the only thing that matters to a local market is supply and demand. How many apartments are available or being built versus how many apartments are actually needed. Then you can get all fancy with other analytics and look at different variables such as leasing absorption, pandemic impacts, supply chain disruptions. You can go all over the place with this stuff, but supply and demand are really the only things that matter. Oakland's historical rental market, rent rates, and its entire situation are best explained by looking at historical deliveries. That's always been the big issue. As you can see, Oakland was kind of a small and a sleepy place to build until 2018. This was because by the end of 2015 and 2016, you saw massive increases in activity from San Francisco. Oakland was a beneficiary of this and was also riding high. They were snagging employer after employer away from San Francisco and Silicon Valley while all of those were looking for a better deal. Going into 2017, JLL ranked Oakland's Class A office rent growth number one in the world at a time where vacancy dropped below an already ridiculous 4%. The office markets of Dubai, Singapore, Hong Kong, all lost out to Oakland in terms of rent growth. Remember that VC money that we were talking about earlier? The startup and venture capital craze of 2014 turned into 2015 job growth. 2016 was a record setting year for the entire Bay Area multifamily market, and that rippled through far and wide. Institutional investors took note, dropped a ton of cash on properties, and the construction machine started revving up. And then, wow, by the end of 2018, that's when you actually see deliveries coming online for Oakland. Even in the early COVID days of 2020, you were still seeing new deliveries because they were actually already well under construction before the pandemic began. Even though there was a pandemic, you're not gonna stop construction that is already underway. People look at headlines about rental rate drops during COVID and they attribute it 100% to COVID itself. Remote work or protests or some sort of paradigm shift where everyone's leaving and no one's coming back. But the truth was, Oakland delivered a lot of apartments all at the same time. However, the story did change. After March of 2020, lenders and investors hit pause on almost all new deals entirely. And the existing pipeline that was already in was the last that Oakland was going to get. Given construction on a new building can be 18 months for a low rise building and three years for a high rise tower, you see the deliveries that just kept coming and then they tapered off after August of 2020. And then if you look a little bit further, they almost nearly completely run out by the end of 2022. There's almost no cranes in the air at all in downtown Oakland as we sit here today, except for one. Given construction on a new building can be 18 months for a low rise and three years for high rise towers, you see the deliveries keep coming, but then they taper off after August of 2020 and then nearly completely run out by the end of 2022. The Concord Group is tracking today's active construction in 2023, 2024, and 2025 will add relatively no new supply at all. A major urban core with mature mass transit and a centralized location in the nation's third largest economy, and no new supply is coming for three years? That alone is a case for massive investment. But wait until I secure all my sites first, would you? So future supply is muted. Where is demand? Demand projections are usually calculated looking at things like projected household growth 
employment growth, the specific nature of that growth underneath, and today's strong propensity to rent versus own. And you can also look at things like expected share of income spent on housing, among other things. TCG research reveals that Oakland's competitive market area needs an additional 1,800 apartment units a year just to stay balanced with expected growth. And that's growth post-COVID underwritten in 2022, so it's muted. With nearly no new deliveries coming in the next few years, Oakland is going to be short over 4,978 units. So the simple math is that looking out to 2026, you have projected demand suggesting 8,105 units are needed and current active construction pipelines might deliver 3,127 units. The Oakland housing market is going to be short 4,978 apartments. That means nearly 5,000 new renters will be battling for homes that are already occupied. When rental demand exceeds supply of apartments, rent goes up. When rental demand drastically outweighs supply by 159%, you get the point. New supply is way down. Demand for existing apartments is going to be way up. What else should we be looking at? Essentially, home ownership. Renting versus owning. It's a substitute for renting if you're buying a home. The key to American home ownership, however, is mortgages. During COVID, the Federal Reserve set rates at zero. The consideration for commutes were thrown out the window and were essentially canceled by mandatory lockdowns and remote work. Thus, resulting home prices shot up 20 to 50% across the entire Bay Area, and in some places, even more. Zoom ahead two years, massive inflation ensued, and now the Federal Reserve is hell-bent on bringing it all down by raising rates. The Federal Reserve raised interest rates an unprecedented seven times since June of 2022. In 2021, I personally refinanced a property with a 30-year fixed rate mortgage for 2.625%. Today, Bankrate.com is showing an average 30-year mortgage rate at 6.51%. That is an increase of 148% from just 18 months ago. With those massive increases in mortgage costs and sky-high prices left over from the pandemic buying rampage, the current cost gap between owning and renting has hit a record 45.86%. With the cost to own being substantially higher than the cost to rent, multifamily markets will have multiple years to run before home ownership starts to pull away high-earning clientele from those big rental buildings. Oakland is near top of my list for multifamily investment prospects, and I believe the case for realizing substantial rent growth in 2024 and 2025 is already in play. Bearing Capital runs multiple different private equity investment funds focused on residential and mixed use real estate, including a flagship tower at 1900 Broadway in uptown Oakland. That is why we know so much about Oakland. It's a 39-story mixed-use apartment tower located directly above the 19th Street BART station. It's only an 11-minute ride to Salesforce Tower and a 9-minute ride the other direction to UC Berkeley. It's also located directly across the street from Uptown Station, which is truly Oakland's most awesome adaptive reuse office building, and it's 100% leased a block. That's 2,000 employee capacity across the board, living directly across the street from this tower. The tower is opening its first phase at the end of 2023, and it expects to be stabilized by 2025. The Bay Area remains the United States tech capital and it harvests over 38% of all venture capital funds raised. COVID also crushed the prospect of competing supply coming online anytime soon. Our 1900 Broadway project is nearly the only crane in downtown Oakland, leaving us a substantial opportunity for a fast lease up. Our competitive market area is going to be nearly 5,000 units short by 2026. This is as strong a case for expedited absorption schedules as I have ever been a part of. And absorption leads to cash. Home ownership has no chance of wrecking the party either when the cost to own is 45% higher than renting. So, if you are looking at Oakland and the timing of your investments are set to be at full power in 2024 or 2025, you are set up to be extremely optimistic about where you're going. If you are more interested in learning about bearing investment activities and analysis just like this one, check out all the links that we put in the description below. If you found this video helpful, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications when the next videos come out. I'm Colin Bearing, and goodbye for now.